This graph shows the medieval warm period and the little ice age. The peak of the medieval warm period was two degrees warmer than today and the little ice age two degrees colder at its worst. The total range is four degrees centigrade. The warming of the 20th century was 0.6 degrees by comparison. This recent warming has melted ice on some of the high passes in the Swiss Alps, uncovering artefacts from the medieval warm period and the prior Roman warm period. The previous graph is derived from this graph produced in the 1990 report of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The medieval warm period has become inconvenient to the IPCC, so they haven't mentioned it since. The energy that stops the Earth from looking like Pluto comes from the Sun, and the level of this energy does change. This graph is of sunspot cycles since 1700. The average length of a sunspot cycle is 10.7 years. The Dalton minimum is a period of lower temperatures from 1796 to 1820, caused by the low amplitude of solar cycles 4 and 5. We are currently near the end of solar cycle 23, is this one. When solar cycle 23 ends is very important, as we'll see in the next few graphs. There is a better correlation between temperature and solar cycle length rather than with solar cycle amplitude. I produced this graph using data from De Bilt in the Netherlands. The slope of the line is 0.6 degrees centigrade per year of solar cycle length. The average length of a solar cycle over the last few hundred years is 10.7 years and has ranged from 7 years to 16 years. A strong relationship between solar cycle length and temperature is seen in other data sets. This is a figure from a 1996 paper by Buckler and Johnson of the Amar Observatory. The slope of the line is half a degree centigrade per one year change in solar cycle length, which amounts to 1.4 thousandths of a degree per day. Now let's assume that the relationship demonstrated in nearly 200 years of Amar data and 300 years of Debult data is valid today. I have plotted on the top of the, uh, this original figure, <coughs> solar cycle 22, which was 9.6 years long. Solar cycle 23 hasn't finished yet. If it was an average cycle length of 10.7 years, it would have finished in January 2007. It is now mid-2007. As we haven't seen the first sunspot from solar cycle 24 yet, Solar cycle 23 will be at least 12 years long. If it is 12 years long, it follows that the temperature at Amar will be 1.2 degrees lower. If solar cycle 24 is as weak as a number of solar physicists are predicting, then solar cycle 23 is likely to be 13 years long or longer. Solar cycle 4, preceding the Dalton minimum, was 13.6 years long. I plotted on this figure what a 13 year long solar cycle 23 would look like. It would result in a 1.6 degree decline in temperature. Now this effect is upon us right now. In a few short years we will have a reversal of the warming of the 20th century. Now this graph demonstrates the transition of one sunspot cycle to the next using the example of the solar cycle 22 to solar cycle 23 transition. Now what we see is, is the, you get sunspots at lower latitudes and the previous cycle continue to die off and at higher latitudes, above 20 degrees latitude, a year before, 20 months before or even longer, you start getting the first sunspots of the next cycle and then they overlap, the overlap is minimum, it's considered to be solar cycle minimum. Solar cycle 23 started in May 1996, rising to a peak of 120.9 in April 2000. For solar cycle 23 to be of average length, solar cycle 24 should have started in January 2007. The first sunspots of a new solar cycle appear usually at more than 20 degrees latitude on the sun's surface. 
According to the last couple of solar cycles, the first sunspots appear 12 to 20 months prior to the start of the new cycle. Now, apart from a few spotless magnetic dipoles, there have not been any reverse polarity sunspots with a latitude of more than 20 degrees to the date of this presentation. This means that solar cycle 24 is at least one year away, or the observational rule is wrong. Large solar cycles usually arrive early and small solar cycles late. If the observational rule regarding the relationship between the first sunspot of the new solar cycle and timing of solar cycle minimum holds, then solar cycle 23 will be at least 12 years long. It also follows that the longer the delay till the month of solar minimum, the weaker the amplitude of solar cycle 24 is likely to be. The experience of the Dalton minimum was that winters were longer and harder, and this effect is with us now. Combining the rural US data set we saw earlier and the projected temperature decline response to weak solar cycles 24 and 25, this graph shows the expected decline to 2030. The temperature decline will be as steep as that of the 1970s cooling scare, but will go on for longer. Ken Shatton is the solar physicist with the best track record in predicting cold solar cycles. His work suggests a return to the advancing glaciers and delayed spring snowmelt of the Little Ice Age for an indeterminate period. Anthropogenic warming is real. It is also minuscule. Using the ModTran facility maintained by the University of Chicago, the relationship between atmospheric carbon dioxide content and increase in average global temperature, atmospheric temperature is shown in this graph. The effect of carbon dioxide on temperature is logarithmic, and thus climate sensitivity decreases with increasing concentration. The first 20 ppm of carbon dioxide has a greater temperature effect than the next 400 ppm. This graph shows emissions of carbon to the atmosphere by the United States, China, and Australia, with historic data from 1906 to 2005, and a projection to 2020. Chinese emissions will overtake US emissions in 2008, and then double from the current level by 2016. Per capita emissions by the three countries will be equivalent by 2020. This graph shows what the temperature would be with and without the warming from anthropogenic carbon dioxide. The anthropogenic effect is able to be calculated, though it is very small relative to natural variation. Carbon dioxide is not even a little bit bad. It is wholly beneficial. This graph from a recent INSO paper shows plant growth response to atmospheric carbon dioxide enrichment. The 100 ppm in carbon dioxide increase since the beginning of industrialization has been responsible for an average increase in plant growth rate of 15% odd. The 50% increase in plant growth rate due to a 300 ppm increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide can be expected about the middle of the next century. A 300 ppm increase is something we can only dream about. C3 cereals include wheat and C4 cereals include maize. The news gets even better for Australia. This is a dry continent and our plants spend a lot of their lives being water stressed. In a world of higher atmospheric carbon dioxide, our crops will use less water per unit of carbon dioxide uptake. It's not all good news. We will need this increase in agricultural productivity to offset the colder weather coming. It also follows that if it, the industrialised countries of the world want to be caring and sharing to the third world, the best thing that could be done for the third world is to increase atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Who would want to deny the third world such a wonderful benefit? 